We're running what I would call a little mini-series, and we're exploring the conversions of file and object storage. What are the key trends? Why would you want to converge file and object? What are the use cases and architectural considerations? And importantly, what are the business drivers of UFFO, so-called Unified Fast File and Object? In this program, you'll hear from Matt Burr, who is the GM of Pure's Flashblade business, and then we'll bring in the perspectives of a solutions architect, Garrett Belsner, who's from CDW, and then the analyst angle with Scott Sinclair of the Enterprise Strategy Group, ESG. He'll share some cool data on our power panel, and then we'll wrap with a really interesting technical conversation with Chris Bond, CB Bond, who is a lead data architect at Microfocus, and he's got a really cool use case to share with us. So sit back and enjoy the program. From around the globe, it's theCUBE, presenting the convergence of file and object. Brought to you by Pure Storage. We're back with the convergence of file and object, a special program made possible by Pure Storage and co-created with theCUBE. So in this series, we're exploring that convergence between file and object storage. We're digging into the trends, the architectures, and some of the use cases for unified fast file and object storage, UFFO. With me is Matt Burr, who's the Vice President and General Manager of Flashblade at Pure Storage. Hello, Matt, how you doing? I'm doing great. Morning, Dave, how are you? Good, thank you. Hey, let's start with a little 101, you know, kind of the basics. What is unified, fast, file, and object? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think you got to start with first principles, talking about the rise of unstructured data. So um, when we think about unstructured data, you sort of think about the projections, 80% of data by 2025 is going to be unstructured data, whether that's machine generated data or, um, you know, AI and ML type workloads. Uh, you start to sort of see this, um, I, I don't want to say it's a boom, uh, but it's sort of a, a renaissance for unstructured data, if you will, where we move away from, you know, what we've traditionally thought of as general purpose NAS mm -hmm. and, and file shares to, you know, really things that focus on uh, fast object, taking advantage of S3 cloud native applications that need to integrate with applications on site, um, you know, AI workloads, ML workloads tend to look to share data across, uh, you know, multiple data sets. And you really need to have a platform that can deliver both highly performant and scalable fast file and object from one system. So talk a little bit more about some of the drivers that, that you know, bring forth that need to, to unify file and object. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, there's a, there's, there's a real challenge um, in managing, you know, bespoke uh, bespoke infrastructure or architectures around general purpose NAS and DAS, et cetera. So um, if you think about how uh, a, a, an architect sort of looks at an application, they might say, well, okay, I need to have, um, you know, fast DAS storage proximal to the application, um, but that's going to require a tremendous amount of DAS, which is a tremendous amount of drives, right? Hard drives are, you know, historically pretty, pretty, pretty unwieldy to manage because you're replacing them relatively consistently at multi petabyte scale. Um, so you start to look at things like, like the complexity of DAS, you start to look at the complexity of general purpose NAS, and you start to just look at, quite frankly, something that a lot of people don't really want to talk about anymore, but actual data center space, right? Like consolidation matters. The ability to take, you know, something that's the size of a microwave, like a modern flash blade or a modern, um, you know, UFFO device uh, replaces something that might be, you know, the size of three or four or five refrigerators. Mm -hmm. So Matt, wh wh why is, is now the right time for this? I mean, for years, nobody really paid much attention to object. S3 obviously changed you know, that course. Most of the world's data is still stored in file formats. You get there with NFS or SMB. Why is now the time to think about unifying object and, and file? Well, because we're moving to things like a contactless society. Um, you know, the, the things that we're going to do are going to just require a tremendous amount more compute power, network, um, and quite frankly, storage throughput. And, you know, I, I can give you two sort of real primary examples here, right? Um, you know, warehouses are being, you know, taken over by robots, if you will. Um, it's not a war. It's a, it's a, it's sort of a friendly advancement in, you know, how do I, how do I store a box in a warehouse? And, you know, we have, we have a customer who focuses on large sort of big box distribution warehousing and, you know, a box that carried a, a an object 
uh, two weeks ago might have a different box size two weeks later. Well, that robot needs to know where the space is in the data center in order to put it, but also needs to be able to process, hey, I don't wanna put the thing that I'm gonna access the most in the back of the warehouse, I'm gonna put that thing in the front of the warehouse. All of those types of data, you know, sort of real time, um, you can think of the robot as almost an edge device, uh, is processing in real time unstructured data and its object. Right? So it's sort of the emergence of these new types of workloads. And I, I give you the opposite example, the other end of the spectrum is ransomware. Right? You know, today, you know, we'll talk to customers and they'll say quite commonly, hey, if, if you know, anybody can sell me a backup device, I need something that can restore quickly. Um, if you had the ability to restore something in 270 terabytes an hour or 250 terabytes an hour, uh, that's much faster. And when you're dealing with a ransomware attack, you want to get your data back quickly. You know, so I want to ask you, I was going to ask you about that later, but since you brought it up, what is the right, I guess call it architecture for, for, for ransomware. I mean, how, and how, explain like how unified uh, object and file would support. I mean, I get the fast recovery, but how, how would you recommend a customer uh, go about architecting a, a ransomware proof you know, system? Yeah, well, you know, with with FlashBlade and and with FlashRay, there's an actual feature called called safe mode, and that safe mode actually protects uh, the snapshots and and the data from uh, sort of being a part of the of of the ransomware event. And so, if you're in a type of ransomware situation like this, you're able to leverage safe mode, and you say, okay, what what happens in a ransomware attack is you can't get access to your data. And so, you know, the bad guy, the perpetrator, is basically saying, hey, I'm not going to give you access to your data until you pay me, you know, X in Bitcoin or whatever it might be, right? Um, with, with, with safe mode, those snapshots are actually protected outside of the ransomware blast zone, and you can bring back those snapshots because what's your alternative? If you're not doing something like that, your alternative is either to pay and unlock your data, or you have to start restoring, restoring excuse me, from tape or slow disk that could take you days or weeks to get your data back. So leveraging safe mode, um, you know, in either the flash or the flash blade product uh, is a great way to go about uh, architecting against ransomware. So I got to put my, my, I'm thinking like a customer now. So safe mode, so that's an, an immutable mode, right? Can't change yeah. the data. Um, is it, can, can an administrator go in and change that mode? Can he turn it off? Yeah. Do I still need an air gap, for example? What would you recommend there? Yeah, so there, there, there are still, um, uh, you know, sort of our back or role based, act, role based access control policies uh, around who can access that safe mode and who can't. Right. Okay. So, uh, anyway, to subject for a different day. I want to, I want to actually bring up, a, a, if you don't object, a topic that I think used to be really front and center, and it now be, is becoming front and center again. I mean, Wikibon just produced a research note forecasting the future of flash and hard drives. And those of you who follow us know we've done this for quite some time. And you can, if you could bring up the chart here, you, you, you could, and, and we see this happening again. It was originally we forecast the, the, the death of, of quote unquote high spin speed disk drives, which is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, but you can see our, uh, here on this chart, this d d hard disk had a magnificent journey, but they peaked in volume in manufacturing volume in 2010. And the reason why that is, is so important, is that volumes now are steadily dropping. You can see that. And, and we use Wright's law to explain why this is a problem. And Wright's law essentially says that as you, you, your cumulative manufacturing volume doubles, your cost to manufacture declined by a constant percentage. Now, I won't go too much detail on that, but suffice it to say that flash volumes are growing very rapidly, HDD volumes aren't. And so, Flash, because of consumer volumes, can take advantage of Wright's law and that constant reduction, and that's was really important for the next generation, which is always more expensive to build. Uh, and so this kind of marks the beginning of the end. Matt, what do you think, what, what's the future hold for spinning disk in your view? Uh, well, I can give you the answer on two levels. On a, on a personal level, uh, it's why I come to work every day. Uh, you know, the the eradication or or extinction of an inefficient thing. Um, you know, I like to say that uh, inefficiency is the bane of my existence, uh, and I think hard drives are largely inefficient. And I'm willing to accept the sort of longstanding argument that um, you know we've seen this transition in block, right? Uh, we're starting to see it repeat itself in in, in unstructured data. Um, and I'm willing to accept the argument that cost is a vector here, and it most certainly is, right? HDDs have been considerably cheaper uh, than, than, than flash storage. 
um, you know, even to this day, uh, you know, up, up to this point, right? But we're starting to approach the point where you sort of reach a, a, a 3X sort of, um, you know, differentiator between the cost of an HDD and an SDD. And, you know, that really is that point in time when uh, you begin to pick up uh, a lot of volume and velocity. And so, you know, that tends to map directly to, you know, what you're seeing here, which is, you know, a, a, a slow decline, uh, which I think is going to become even more rapid, kind of probably starting around next year, um, where you start to see SD, S, excuse me, SSDs, uh, you know, really replacing HDDs uh, at a much more rapid clip, particularly on the unstructured data side, and it's largely around cost. The the workloads that we talked about, robots and warehouses, or you know, other types of advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence type applications and workflows, you know, they require a degree of performance that a hard drive just can't deliver. We are we are seeing sort of the um, creative, innovative. Uh, disruption of an entire industry right before our eyes. It's a fun thing to live through. Yeah, and and we would agree. I mean, it doesn't. The premise there is that it, it, it doesn't have to be less expensive. We think it will be by you know the, the second half or early second half of this decade. But even if it's a, we think around a three x delta, the value of of SSD relative to spinning disk is going to overwhelm. Just like with your laptop, you know, it got to the point where you said, why would I ever have a spinning disk in my laptop? We see the same thing happening here. Um, and and so and we're talking about you know raw capacity you know put in yeah. compression and dedupe and everything else that you really can't do with spinning disk because of the performance issues you can do with flash. Okay, let's come back to UFFO. Can we dig into the challenges specifically that that this solves for customers? Give me give us some examples. Yeah, so you know I mean if we if we think about the examples, um, you know the 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 robotic one um, I think is 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 the one that I think is the marker for you know kind of 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 the the modern side of 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 what we see here. Um, but what we're you know what we're what we're seeing from a trend perspective, which you know not everybody is deploying robots, right? Um, you know there, there's there's many companies that are you know uh, that aren't going to be in either the robotic business uh, or or even thinking about you know sort of future type oriented type things. But what they are doing is greenfield applications that are being built on object, um, generally not on not on file and, and and not on block. And so you know the rise of of object as sort of the the sort of let's call it the 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 next great protocol for um, you know for uh, for for modern workloads, right? This is this is that that modern application coming to the forefront, and that could be anything from you know financial institutions, you know, right down through. Um, even, we've even seen it in, seen it in oil and gas. Uh, we're also seeing it um, across across healthcare. Uh, so you know, as 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 companies take the opportunity, as industries take the this opportunity to modernize, you know, they're modernizing not on things that are are leveraging, you know, um, you know, sort of archaic disk technology. They're 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 really focusing on 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 object, but they still have file workflows that they need to that they need to be able to support. And so, having the ability to be able to deliver those things from one device in a capacity orientation or a performance orientation, uh, while at the same time. Uh, dramatically simplifying uh, the overall administration of your environment, both physically and non-physically, is a key driver. So the great thing about object is it's simple. It's a kind of a get put metaphor. Um, it's, yeah. It scales out, you know, because it's got metadata associated with the data uh, and, and, and it's cheap. Uh, the drawback is you don't necessarily associate it with high performance and, and, and as well, most applications don't, you know, speak in that language, they speak in the language of file, you know, or as you mentioned, block. So I, I see real opportunities here. If I have some, some data that's not necessarily frequently accessed, you know, every day, but yet I want to then, whatever, end of quarter or whatever it is, I want to, I want to, or, or machine learning, or I want to apply some AI to that data. I want to bring it in and then ap apply a file format uh, because for, Performance reasons, is that right? Maybe you could unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, we see, I mean, I, I think you described it well, right? Um, but I don't think object necessarily has to be slow, um, and nor does it have to be, um, you know, because when you think about, you brought up a good point with metadata, right? Being able to scale to a billions of object, being able to scale to billions of objects, excuse me, is of value, right? Um, and I think people do traditionally associate object with slow, but it's not necessarily slow anymore, right? We, we did a, a sort of unofficial survey of, 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 our, of our customers and our employee base. And when people described object, they thought of it as like law firms and storing a Word doc, if right. you will. 
Um, and that, that's just, you know, I think that there's a, a, um, a lack of understanding or a misnomer around what modern, what modern object has become and performant object, particularly at scale, when we're talking about billions of objects, you know, that's the next frontier, right? Um, is it at pace performance wise with, you know, the other protocols? No, uh, but it's making leaps and grounds. So you, you talked a little bit more about some of the verticals that you see. I mean, I think when I think of financial services, I think of transaction processing, but of course they have a lot of tons of unstructured data. Are there any yeah. patterns you're seeing by, by vertical market? Um, we're, you know, we're not, that's the interesting thing. Um, and, you know, um, as a, as a, as a, as a company with a, with a block heritage or a block DNA, those patterns were pretty easy to spot, right? There were a certain number of databases that you really needed to support Oracle, SQL, some Postgres work, et cetera. Then kind of the modern databases around Cassandra and things like that. You knew that there were going to be VMware environments, you know, you could, you could sort of see the trends and where things were going. Unstructured data is such a, a broader horizontal um, thing, right? So, you know, inside of oil and gas, for example, you have, you know, um, you have specific applications and bespoke infrastructures for those applications. Um, you know, inside of media entertainment, you have the same thing. The, the trend that we're seeing, the commonality that we're seeing is the modernization of, you know, object as a starting point for all of the, all, all of the net new workloads within, within those industry verticals, right? That, that's the most common request we see is what's your object roadmap? What's your, you know, what's your, what's your object strategy? You know, where do you think, where do you think object is going? So um, there isn't any, um, you know, sort of, uh, there's no, there's no path. Uh, it's really just kind of a wide open field in front of us with common requests across all industries. So the amazing thing about Pure, just as, as a kind of a little, you know, quasi, you know, armchair historian in the industry, is Pure was really the only company in many, many years to be able to achieve escape velocity, break through a billion dollars. I mean. Three Park couldn't do it, Isilon couldn't do it, Compellent couldn't do it, I, I could go on. But Pure was able to achieve that as an independent company. Uh, and so you become a leader. You look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, you're a leader in there. I mean, if you made it this far, you got to have some chops. And so, of course, it's very competitive. There are a number of other storage suppliers that have announced products that unify object and file. So I'm interested in how Pure differentiates. Why Pure? Um, it's a great question, um, and it's one that uh, you know, having been a long time Puritan, uh, you know, I take pride in answering. Um, and it's it's actually a really simple answer. Um, it's it's business model, innovation, and technology, right? The, the the technology that goes behind how we do what we do, right? And I don't mean the product. Right, innovation is product, but having a better support model, for example, um, or having on the business model side, you know, evergreen storage, right, where we sort of look at your relationship to us as a subscription, right? Um, you know, we're going to sort of take the thing that that you've had, and we're going to modernize that thing in place over time, such that you're not rebuying that same, you know, terabyte or you know, petabyte of storage that you've that you that you've paid for over time. So, um, you know, sort of three legs of the stool. Uh, that that have made you know pure clearly differentiated. I think the market has has recognized that. Um, you're you're right. It's it's hard to break through to a billion dollars. Um, but I look forward to the day that you know we we have two billion dollar products. And I think with uh, you know that rise in in unstructured data growing to eighty percent by twenty twenty five, and you know the massive transition that you know you guys have noted in 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 your HDD slide. Uh, I think it's a, a huge opportunity for us on you know the other unstructured data side of the house. You know the other thing I'd, I'd add, Matt, and I've talked to Kaz about this is is it's simplicity first. I've asked them, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And the answer is always the same: is that adds complexity, and we we put simplicity for the customer ahead of everything else. And I think that served you very very well. What about the economics of of, of unified file and object? I, I mean, if you bring in additional value, presumably there's a there there's a cost to that, but there's got to be also a business case behind it. What kind of impact have you seen uh, with customers? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to something I mentioned earlier, which is just the reclamation of floor space and power and cooling, right? Um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, people, people, people want to search for kind of the, the, the sexier element, if you will, when it comes to uh, looking at how, we, how, how you, know, you derive value from something. But the reality is if you're reducing your power consumption by, you know, by, by a material percentage, um, power bills matter in big, in big data centers. Um, you know, customers typically are, are, are facing, a, you know, a paradigm of, 
well, I, I, I want to go to the cloud, but you know, the cloud turned out to be more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Or, you know, I've figured out what I can use in the cloud. And I thought it was going to be everything, but it's not going to be everything. So hybrid's where we're landing, but I want to be out of the data center business. And I, I don't want to have a team of 20 storage people to match, you know, to administer my storage. Um, you know, so there's sort of this, this very tangible value around, you know, hey, if, if I could manage, um, you know, uh, multiple petabytes with one full-time engineer, uh, because the system, uh, to, to your and Kaz's point, was radically simpler to administer, didn't require someone to be running around swapping drives all the time, would that be a value? The answer is yes, 100% of the time, right? Um, and then you start to look at, okay, all right, well, on the UFFO side, from a product perspective, hey, if I have to manage a you know bespoke environment for this application, if I have to manage a bespoke environment for this application and a bespoke environment for this application and a bespoke environment for this application, I'm managing four different things. And can I actually share data across those four different things? There's ways to share data, but most customers, it gets, gets too complex. How do you even know what your, what your gold dot master copy is of data if you have it in four different places or you try to have it in four different places and it's four different spot, siloed infrastructures? So when you get to the sort of the side of, you know, how do, we, how do you measure value in UFFO, it's actually being able to have all of that data concentrated in one place so that you can share it from application to application. Got it. I'm interested, we have a couple minutes left. I'm interested in the, the update on FlashBlade, you know, generally, but also I have a specific question. I mean, look, getting file right is, is hard enough. Uh, you just announced SMB support for FlashBlade. I'm interested in, you know, how, how that fits in. I think it's kind of obvious with file and object converging, but give us the update on, on FlashBlade and maybe you could address that specific question. Yeah, so um, look, I mean, we're, we're um, you know, tremendously excited about the growth of FlashBlade. Uh, you know, we, we, we found workloads we never expected to find. Um, you know, the rapid restore workload was one that was actually brought to us from, from, from a customer actually, um, and has become, you know, one of, our, one of our top two, three, four, you know, workloads. So, um, you know, we're really happy with the trend we've seen in it. Um, and, you know, mapping back to, you know, thinking about HDDs and SSDs, you know, we're well on a path to building a, a billion dollar our business here. So, you know, we're very excited about that. Um, but to your point, you know, you don't just snap your fingers and get there, right? Um, you know, we've learned that doing file and object uh, is, is harder than block. Um, because there's more things that you have to go do. For one, you're basically focused on three protocols, SMB, NFS, and S3, not necessarily in that order. Um, but to your point about SMB, uh, you know, we, we are uh, on the path through to releasing, um, you know, SMB, uh, full, full native SMB support in, in the system. That will allow us to uh, service customers. We have a limitation with some customers today where they'll have an SMB portion of their NFS workflow. Um, and we do great on the NFS side, um, but you know we didn't we didn't have the ability to plug into the S and B component of their workflow. So that's going to open up a lot of opportunity for us um, on on that front. Um, and you know we continue to you know invest significantly across the board in in areas like security, which is you know become a, a more than just a hot button. You know today security has always been there, but it feels like it's blazing hot today. Um, oh, yeah. And so, you know, going through the next couple of years, we'll be looking at, uh, you know, developing some, some um, you know, pretty material security elements of the product as well. So uh, well on a path to a billion dollars is the net on that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have, have SMB here and we're looking forward to introducing that to, to those customers that have, you know, NFS workloads today with an SMB component. Yeah, nice tailwind, good TAM expansion strategy. Matt, thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming on the program. We appreciate you having us and uh, thanks much, Dave. Good to see you. Okay, we're back with the convergence of file and object and a power panel. This is a special content program made possible by Pure Storage and co-created with theCUBE. Now in this series, what we're doing is we're exploring the coming together of file and object storage. We're trying to understand the trends that are driving this convergence, the architectural considerations that users should be aware of, and which use cases make the most sense for so-called unified fast file and object storage. And with me are three great guests to unpack these issues. Garrett Belsner is the data center solutions architect. He's with CDW. Scott Sinclair is a senior analyst at Enterprise Strategy Group. He's got deep experience on enterprise storage and brings that independent analyst perspective. And Matt Burr is back with us. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Hey Scott, let me let me start with you uh, and get your perspective on what's going on in the market with with object, the cloud, huge amount of unstructured data out there that lives in files. Give us your independent view of the trends that you're seeing out there. 
Well, Dave, you know where to start. I mean, surprise, surprise, data is growing. Um, but one of the big things that we've seen is we've been talking about data growth for what, decades now? But what's really fascinating is, or, or changed, is because of the digital economy, digital business, digital transformation, whatever you call it, now people are not just storing data, they actually have to use it. And so we see this in trends like analytics and artificial intelligence. And what that does is it's just increasing the demand for not only consolidation of massive amounts of storage that we've seen for a while, but also the demand for incredibly low latency access to that storage. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing that's driving this need for convergence, as you put it, of having multiple protocols consolidated onto one platform, but also the need for high performance access to that data. Thank you for that, a great setup. I got like, I wrote down three topics that we're going to unpack as a result of that. So Garrett, let me, let me go to you. Maybe you can give us the perspective of what you see with customers. Is, is, this, is this like a push yeah. where customers are saying, hey, listen, I need to converge my file and object, or is it more a story where they're saying, Garrett, I, I have this problem, and then you see unified file and object as a solution? Yeah, I think, I think for us, it's you know, taking that consultative approach with our customers and really kind of hearing pain around some of the pipelines, the way that they're going to market with data today and kind of what are the problems that they're seeing. We're also seeing a lot of the change driven by the software vendors as well. So really being able to support a disaggregated design where you're not having to upgrade and maintain everything as a single block has really been a, a place where we've seen a lot of customers pivot to where they have more flexibility as they need to maintain larger volumes of data and higher performance data having the ability to do that separate from compute and cache and some of those other layers are, are, is really critical. So Matt, I wonder if, if you could you know, follow up on that. So, so Gary was talking about this disaggregated design. So I like it, you know, distributed cloud, et cetera. But then we're talking about bringing things together in, in one place, right? So square that circle. How, how does this fit in with this hyper distributed cloud edge that's getting built out? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I could give you the easy answer on that, but I could also pass it back to, to Garrett in the sense that, you know, Garrett, maybe it's important to talk about um, Elastic and Splunk and some of the things that you're seeing in in that world and and how that, I think the answer to Dave's question, I think you can give a, you can give a pretty qualified answer relative to what your customers are seeing. Oh, that'd be great, please. Yeah, absolutely, no, no problem at all. So, you know, I think with um, Splunk kind of moving from its traditional design and classic design, whatever you want to you want to call it, up into Smart Store, um, that was kind of one of the first that we saw kind of make that move towards kind of separating object out. And I think you know a lot of that comes from their own move to the cloud and updating their code to basically take advantage of object object in the cloud. Um, but we're starting to see you know with like Vertica, Eon, for example, um, Elastic other folks taking that same type of approach where in the past we, we were building out many 2U servers, we were jamming them full of uh, you know SSDs and NVMe drives. Um, that was great, but it, it doesn't really scale and it kind of gets into that same problem that we see with you know hyperconvergence a little bit where it's you know you're all you're always adding something maybe that you didn't want to add. Um, so I think it, it you know again being driven by software is really kind of where we're seeing the world open up there. Um, but that whole idea of just having that as a hub and a central place where you can then leverage that out to other applications, whether that's out to the edge for machine learning or AI applications to take advantage of it. I think that's where that convergence really comes back in. Um, but I think like Scott mentioned earlier, it, it's really folks are now doing things with the data where before I think they were really storing it, trying to figure out what are we going to actually do with it when we need to do something with it. So this is making it possible. Yeah, and Dave, if I could just sort of tack on to the end of Garrett's answer there, you know, in particular with Vertica with Neon Mode, the ability to leverage sharded subclusters give you, um, you know, sort of an advantage in terms of being able to isolate performance hotspots. You, an advantage to that is being able to do that on a flash blade, for example. So um, sharded subclusters allow you to sort of say, hey, I'm, you know, I am going to give prioritization to, you know, this particular element of my application and my data set, but I can still share those, share that data across those, across those subclusters. So, um, um, you know, as you see, you know, Vertica advance with the on mode, or you see Splunk advance with with Smart Store. Um, you know, these are all sort of advancements that are, you know, it, it's a chicken and the egg thing. Um, they need faster storage. They need, you know, sort of a consolidated data a storage data set, um, and and that's what sort of allows these things to drive forward. Yeah. So Vertica Eon mode for those who don't know, it's the ability to separate compute and storage and scale independently. I think I think Vertica 
if they're, if they're not the only one, they're one of the only ones, I think they might even be the only one that does that in the cloud and on-prem. And that sort of plays into this dis distributed you know, nature uh, of this hyper-distributed cloud, I sometimes call it. And, and I'm interested in the, in the data pipeline. And, and I wonder, Scott, if we could talk a little bit about that, maybe where unified object and file fit. I mean, I'm envisioning this, this distributed mesh and, and then you know, UFFO is sort of a node on that that I, I can tap when I need it. But, but Scott, what are you seeing as the state of infrastructure as it relates to the data pipeline and the trends there? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. So when, when I think data pipeline, I immediately gravitate to analytics or, or machine learning initiatives, right? And so one of the big things we see, and this is, it, it's an interesting trend. It seems, you know, we continue to see increased investment in AI, increased interest, and people think, and as companies get started, they think, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, I got to go hire a data scientist. Okay, well, that data scientist probably needs some infrastructure. And what they end, what often happens in these environments is where it ends up being a, a bespoke environment or a one-off environment. And then over time, organizations run into challenges. And one of the big challenges is the data science team or people whose jobs are outside of IT spend way too much time trying to get the infrastructure um, to, to keep up with their demands and predominantly around data performance. So one of the, one of the ways organizations that especially have artificial intelligence workloads in production, and we found this in our research, have started mitigating that is by deploying flash all across the data pipeline. We have, and, we have data on this, sorry to interrupt, but Pat, yeah. Pat if you could bring up that, that chart, that would be great. Um, so take us through this, uh, uh, Scott, and, and share with us what we're looking at here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Dave, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. So we did this study, um, I want to say late last year, uh, one of the things we looked at was across artificial intelligence environments. Now, one thing that you're not seeing on this slide is we went through and we asked all around the data pipeline and we saw flash everywhere. But I thought this was really telling because this is around data lakes. And when, when or, many people think about the idea of a data lake, they think about it as a repository, it's a place where you keep maybe cold data. And what we see here is, especially within production environments, a pervasive use of flash storage. So I think that 69% of organizations are saying their data lake is mostly flash or all flash. And I think we have 0% that don't have any flash in that environment. So organizations are finding out that they that flash is an essential technology to allow them to harness the value of their data. So uh, Garrett and, and then Matt, I wonder if you could chime in as well. We talk about digital transformation and I, I sometimes call it you know, the COVID forced march to digital transformation. <laughs> and, and, and I'm curious as to your perspective on things like machine learning and the adoption, um, and, and Scott, you may have a perspective on this as well. You know, we had to pivot, we had to get laptops, we had to secure the endpoints, you know, and VDI, those became super high priorities. What happened to, you know, injecting AI into my applications and, and machine learning? Did that go in the back burner? Was that accelerated along with the need to, to digitally transform? Uh, Garrett, I wonder if you could share with us what you saw with, with customers last year. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely saw an acceleration. Um, I think folks are in in my market are are still kind of figuring out how they inject that into more of a widely distributed business use case. Um, but again, this data hub and allowing folks to now take advantage of this data that they've had in these data lakes for a long time. I agree with Scott. I mean, many of the data lakes that we have were somewhat flash accelerated, but they were typically really made up of, you know, large capacity, uh, slower spinning nearline drives, um, accelerated with some flash, but I'm really starting to see folks now look at some of those older Hadoop implementations and really leveraging new ways to look at how they consume data. And many of those redesigned customers are coming to us wanting to look at all flash solutions. So we're definitely seeing it and we're seeing an acceleration towards folks trying to figure out how to actually use it in more of a business sense now, or before I feel like it was a little bit more skunk works kind of people dealing with, uh, you know, in a much smaller situation, maybe in the executive offices, trying to do some testing and things. Scott, you're nodding away. Anything you can add here? Yeah, so well, first off, it's great to get that confirmation that the stuff we're seeing in our research, Garrett's seeing, you know, out in the field and in the real world, um, but at, you know, as it relates to really the past year, it's been really fascinating. So one of the things we, we study at ESG is 
IT buying intentions? What are things, what are initiatives that companies plan to invest in? And at the beginning of 2020, we saw heavy interest in machine learning initiatives. Then you transition to the middle of 2020 in the midst of COVID, uh, some organizations continued on that path, but a lot of them had the pivot, right? How do we get laptops to everyone? How do we continue business in this new world? Well, now as we enter into 2021, and hopefully we're coming out of this, uh, you know, the, the pandemic era, um, we're getting into a world where organizations are pivoting back towards these strategic investments around how do I maximize the usage of data and actually accelerating those because they've seen the importance of, of digital business initiatives over the past year. Yeah, Matt, I mean, when we exited 2019, we saw a narrowing of experimentation and our premise was, you know, that, the, that organizations are going to start now operationalizing all their digital transformation experiments. And, and then we had a, you know, 10 month Petri dish on, on digital. So what are you, what are you seeing in this regard? Uh, a 10 month Petri dish is an interesting way to, do, interesting way to describe it. Um, you know, we, we saw another, we, there's another, there's another candidate for pivot in there around ransomware as well, right? Um, you know, security entered into the mix, uh, which took people's attention away from some of this as well. I mean, look, I, I'd like to bring this up just a, a level or two, um, because what we're actually talking about here is progress, right? And, and progress is an, is an inevitability. Um, you know, whether it's, whether, whether you believe that it's by 2025 or you, or you think it's 2035 or 2050, it doesn't matter. We're on a forced march to the eradication of disc. And that is happening in many ways, uh, you know, in many ways, um, due to some of the things that Garrett was referring to and what Scott was referring to in terms of what are customers demands for how they're going to actually leverage the data that they have. And that brings me to kind of my final point on this, which is we see customers in three phases. There's the first phase where they say, Hey, I have this large data store and I know there's value in there, I don't know how to get to it. Or I have this large data store and I've started a project to get value out of it and we failed. Those could be customers that, um, you know, marched down the Hadoop, the Hadoop path early on and they, they, they got some value out of it, um, but they realized that, you know, HDFS wasn't gonna be a modern protocol going forward for any number of reasons. You know, the first being, hey, if I have gold.master, how do I know that I have gold.4 is consistent with my gold.master? So data consistency matters. Uh, and then you have the, the sort of third group that says, I have these large data sets I know how to extract value from them and I'm already on to the verticas, the elastics, you know, the splunks, et cetera. Um, I think those folks are the folks that that latter group are the folks that kept their, their, their projects going because they were already extracting value from them. The first two groups we we're, we're seeing sort of saying the second half of this year is when we're going to begin really being picking up on these, on these types of initiatives again. Well, uh, thank you, Matt, by the way, for, for hitting the escape key, because I think value from data really is what this is all about. And there are some real blockers there that I kind of want to talk about. You mentioned HDFS. I mean, we were very excited, of course, in the early days of Hadoop. Many of the concepts were profound, but at the end of the day, it was too complicated. We've got these hyper-specialized roles that are, that are you, you know, serving the business, but it still takes too long. It's, it's too hard to get, get value from data. And one of the blockers is infrastructure. That, the complexity of that infrastructure really needs to be abstracted, taken up a level. We're starting to see this in, in cloud where you're seeing some of those abstraction layers being built from some of the cloud vendors. But more importantly, a, a lot of the vendors like Pew are saying, hey, we can do that heavy lifting for you. Uh, and and we, you know, we have expertise in engineering to do cloud native. So I, I'm wondering what you guys see, uh, maybe Garrett, you could start us off and others chime in as some of the blockers uh, to getting value from data and, and how we're going to address those in the coming decade. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of it we're solving here, obviously with, with Pure bringing, uh, you know, Flash to a market that traditionally was utilizing uh, much slower media. Um, you know, the other thing that I, that I see that's very nice with Flashblade, for example, is the ability to kind of do things, you know, once you get it set up a blade at a time. I mean, a lot of the things that we see from just kind of more of a, you know, simplistic approach to this, like a lot of these teams don't have big budgets and being able to kind of break them down into almost a blade type chunk, I think has really kind of allowed folks to get more projects and, and things off the ground because they don't have to buy a full expensive system to run these projects. Um, so that's helped a lot. I think the wider use cases have helped a lot. So. Um, Matt mentioned ransomware, um, you know, using safe mode as a, as a place to help with ransomware has been a really big growth spot for us. We've got a lot of customers very interested and excited about that. 
Um, and the other thing that I would say is bringing DevOps into data is another thing that we're seeing. So kind of that push towards data ops and really kind of using automation and infrastructure as code as a way to now kind of drive things through the system the way that we've seen with automation through DevOps is, is really an area we're seeing a ton of growth with from a services perspective. Hey, hey guys, any other thoughts on that? I mean, we're, I, I'll, I'll tee it up there. I, I, we are seeing some bleeding edge, which is somewhat counterintuitive, especially from a cost standpoint, organizational changes at some, some companies. Uh, think of some of the, 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 the internet companies that do uh, music, uh, for instance, and adding podcasts, et cetera. And those are different data products. We're seeing them actually reorganize their data architectures to make them more distributed uh, and, and actually put the domain heads, the business heads in charge of the, the data and the data pipeline. Now that is maybe less efficient, but, but it's again, some of these bleeding edge. What else are you guys seeing out there that might be you know, some harbinger of, of the next decade? I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, I think specific to um, the the construct that you threw out, Dave. One of the things that we're seeing is, um, you know, the, the the application owner. Maybe it's the DevOps person, but it's you know, maybe it's it, it's it's the application owner through the DevOps person. They're they're becoming more technical in their understanding of how infrastructure um, interfaces with their with their application. I think um, you know what what we're seeing on the Flashblade side is we're, we're having a lot more conversations with application people than um, just IT people. It doesn't mean that the IT people aren't there. The IT people are still there for sure. They have to deliver the service, etc. Um, but you know the days of of IT you know building up a uh, catalog of services and a business owner subscribing to one of those services, you know, picking, you know, whatever sort of fits their need. Um, I don't think that construct, I think that's the construct that changes going forward. The application owner is becoming much more prescriptive about what they want the infrastructure to, to fit, how they want the infrastructure to fit into their application. Um, and that's a big change. And, and for, for um, you know, certainly folks like, like Garrett and CDW, um, you know, they do a good job with this, being able to sort of get to the application owner and bring those two sides together. There's a tremendous amount of value there. Uh, for us, it's been a little bit of a, of a retooling. We've traditionally sold to the IT side of the house and, um, you know, we've had to teach ourselves how to go talk the language of, of applications. So, um, you know, I think you pointed out a good, a good, a good construct there. And, and, you know, that, that application owner taking, playing a much bigger role in what they're expecting uh, from the performance of IT infrastructure, I think is, is, is a key, is a key change. Interesting. I mean, that definitely is a trend. It's put you guys closer to the business where the, the infrastructure team is, is serving the business as opposed to sometimes I talk to data experts uh, and they're frustrated, uh, especially data owners or, or, yeah. or, or data product builders who are frustrated that they feel like they have to beg, beg the, the data pipeline team to get you know, new data sources or, or get data out. How about the edge? Um, you know, maybe Scott, you can kick us off. I mean, we're seeing you know, the emergence of, of edge use cases, AI inferencing at the edge, a lot of data at the edge. What are you seeing there? And, and how does this unified object, I'll bring us back to that and file fit? Wow, Dave, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> Two minutes. So, uh, <laughs> well, first of all, Scott, why don't, you, why don't you just tell everybody what the edge is? You got, you got well, it all figured gosh, out, right? How much time do you have, Matt? Um, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, it, and that, that's, that's a great question, right? Is if you take a step back, and I think it comes back to Dave, something you mentioned, it's about extracting value from data. And what that means is when you extract value from data, what it does is as Matt pointed out, the the influencers or the users of data, the application owners, they have more power because they're driving revenue now. And so what that means is from an IT standpoint, it's not just, hey, here are the services you get, use them or, or lose them or you know, don't throw a fit. It is, no, I have to, I have to adapt. I have to follow what my application owners mean. Now when you bring that back to the edge, what it means is is that data is not localized to the data center. I mean, we just went through a nearly 12 month period where the entire workforce for most of the companies in this country had went distributed and business continued. So if business is distributed, data is distributed. And that means that means in the data center, that means at the edge, that means at the cloud, and that means in all other places, in tons of places. And what it also means is you have to be able to extract and utilize data 
anywhere it may be. And I think that's something that we're going to continue to and uh, continue to see. And I think it comes back to, you know, if you think about key characteristics, we've talked about um, things like performance and scale for years, but we need to start rethinking it because on one hand, we need to get performance everywhere, but also in terms of scale, and this ties back to some of the other initiatives and getting value from data, it's uh, something I call the, the massive success problem. One of the things we see, especially with, with workloads like machine learning, is businesses find success with them. And as soon as they do, they say, well, I need about 20 of these projects now. Well, all of a sudden that overburdens IT organizations, especially across across core and edge and cloud environments. And so when you look at environments, ability to meet performance and scale demands wherever it needs to be is something that's really important. You know, so Dave, I'd like to um, just sort of tie together sort of two things that um, I think that I heard from Scott and Garrett that I think are important and it's around this concept of scale. Um, you know, it, it, some of us uh, are old enough to remember the day when kind of a, a 10 terabyte blast radius was too big of a blast radius for people to, to take on, or a terabyte of storage was considered to be, um, you know, a, a, an exemplary budget environment, right? Um, now we sort of think as terabytes, kind of like we used to think of as gigabytes in some ways. Um, petabyte, like you don't have to explain to anybody what a petabyte is anymore. Um, and, you know, what's on the horizon, and it's not far, are, are exabyte type data set workloads. Um, and you start to think about what could be in that exabyte of data. We've talked about how you extract that value. We've talked about sort of um, how you start. But if the scale is big, not everybody's going to start at a petabyte or an exabyte, to Garrett's point. The ability to start small and grow into these products, or excuse me, these projects, I think is a, is a really um, fundamental concept here because you're not going to just go buy five. I'm, I'm going I'm to go kick off a five petabyte project. Whether you do that on disk or flash, it's going to be expensive, right? But if you could start at a couple hundred terabytes, not just as a proof of concept, but as something that you know you could get predictable value out of that then you could say, hey, this either scales linearly or non-linearly in a way that I can then go map my investments to how I can go dig deeper into this. That's how all of these things are gonna, that's how these successful projects are gonna start. Because the people that are starting with these very large, you know, sort of um, expansive, you know, greenfield projects at multi-petabyte scale, it's gonna be hard to realize near-term value. Excellent. We we're, we got to wrap, but but Garrett, I wonder if you could close. When you look forward, you talk to customers. Do you see this unification of, of file and object? Is it is this an evolutionary trend? Is it something that is that that is that is that is going to be a, a lever that customers use? How, how do you see it evolving over the next two, three years and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think from our perspective, I mean, just from what we're seeing from the numbers within the market, the the amount of growth that's happening with unstructured data is really just starting to finally really kind of hit this data deluge or whatever you want to call it that we've been talking about for so many years. Um, it really does seem to now be, be coming true. Um, as we start to see things scale out and really folks settle into, okay, I'm going to use the cloud to, to start and maybe train my models, but now I'm going to get it back on prem because of latency or security or whatever the, the, the um, decision points are there. Um, this is something that is not going to slow down. And, and I think, you know, folks like Pure having the ability to have the tools that they give us um, to use and bring to market with our customers are, are really key and critical for us. So I, I see it as a huge growth area and a big focus for us moving forward. Guys, great job unpacking a topic that, you know, it's covered a little bit, but I think we, we covered some ground that is, uh, that is new. And so thank you so much for those insights and that data. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Okay, and thank you for watching the convergence of file and object. Keep it right there, right back after this short break. Innovation, impact, influence. Welcome to theCUBE. Disruptors, developers, and practitioners. Learn from the voices of leaders who share their personal insights from the hottest digital events around the globe. Enjoy the best this community has to offer on theCUBE, your global leader in high-tech digital coverage. Okay, now we're going to get the customer perspective on object and we'll talk about 
the convergence of file and object, but really focusing on the object piece. This is a content program that's being made possible by Pure Storage and is co-created with theCUBE. Christopher C.B. Bond is here. He's a lead architect for MicroFocus, uh, the enterprise data warehouse and principal data engineer at MicroFocus. C.B., welcome, good to see you. Thanks, Dave, good to be here. So tell us more about your role uh, at MicroFocus. It's a pan MicroFocus role. Of course, we know the company is a you know, multinational software firm. It acquired the software ad assets of, of HP, of course, including Vertica. Tell us where you fit. Yeah, so MicroFocus is, uh, you know, it's like you said, it's wide, worldwide uh, company that uh, it sells a lot of software products all over the place to governments and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, it also grows often by acquiring other companies. So right. there is the problem of, of integrating new companies and their data. And so what's happened over the years is that th they've had a, a, a number of different discrete data systems. So you've had this data spread all over the place and they've never been able to get a full complete introspection on the entire business because of that. So my role was to come in, design a central data repository an enterprise data warehouse that all reporting could be uh, generated against. And so uh, that's what we're doing. And we selected Vertica as the EDW um, system and Pure Storage FlashBlade as the communal repository. Okay, so you obviously had experience with, with Vertica in your, in your previous role, so it's not like you were starting from scratch, but, but paint a picture of what life was like before you embarked on this sort of consolidated a, a, approach to your, your data warehouse. Was it just disparate data all over the place? A lot of M&A going on? W where did the so, data live? Right, so it, again, the, the, the data was all over the place, including under people's desks in <laughs> just dedicated, you know, their, their own private uh, SQL servers. It, a lot of uh, data in, in um, MicroFocus is, is run on SQL Server which has pros and cons, because that's a great uh, transactional database, but it's not really good for analytics, in my opinion. So, uh, but a lot of stuff was running on that. They had one Vertica instance that was doing some select uh, reporting, it wasn't a very uh, powerful system, and it was what they call Vertica Enterprise Mode, where it had dedicated nodes, which um, had the compute and storage um, in the same locus on each uh, server, okay? So Vertica Eon mode is uh, a whole new world because it separates compute from storage. You mentioned Eon mode uh, and, and the ability to, 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 to scale storage and compute independently. We wanted to have the um, analytics OLAP stuff close to the OLTP stuff, right? Uh, so that's why they're co-located co uh, very close to each other. Um, and so, uh, we could, what's nice about this situation is that these S3 objects, it's an S3 object store on the pure flash blade. We could copy those over if we needed to uh, AWS and we could spin up um, a, uh, a version of Vertica there and keep going. It's, it's, it's like a tertiary DR strategy because we, we actually have a, we're, we're setting up a second flash blade Vertica system geolocated elsewhere for backup, and we can get into it if you want to talk about how the latest version of the pure software for the FlashBlade allows synchronization across network boundaries of those FlashBlades, which is really nice because if uh, you know there's a giant sinkhole opens up under our Colo facility and we lose that thing, then we just have to switch the DNS and we, we're back in business off the DR. And then if that one was to go, we could copy those objects over to AWS and, and be up and running there. So we're feeling pretty confident about being able to weather whatever comes along. So you're using the, the pure flash blade as an object store. Um, m most people think, oh, object, simple but slow. Um, not the case for you, is that right? Not the case at all. Why this is that? Is, it's ripping. Um, well, you have to understand about Vertica and the way it stores data. It stores data in what they call storage containers. And those are immutable, okay, on disk. Whether it's on AWS or if you had a, a enterprise mode Vertica, if you do an update or delete, it actually has to go and retrieve that object container from disk and it destroys it and rebuilds it, okay? 
which is why you don't, you, you want to avoid updates and deletes with Vertica because the way it gets its, its speed is by sorting and ordering and encoding the data on disk so it can read it really fast. Um, but if you do an operation where you're deleting or updating a record in the middle of that, then you've got to rebuild that entire thing. So that actually matches up really well with uh, S3 object storage because it's kind of the same way. It, uh, it gets destroyed and rebuilt too, okay? So that matches up very well with Vertica and we were able to design the system so that it's append only. Now we had some reports that were running in SQL Server, okay? Uh, which were taking seven days. So we moved that to, uh, to Vertica from SQL Server and uh, we rewrote the queries which, were ha which had been written in T-SQL with a bunch of loops and so forth and we were to get this is amazing. It went from seven days to two seconds uh, to generate this report, which has tremendous value uh, to the company because it would have to have this long cycle of seven days to get a new introspection into what they call their knowledge base. And now all of a sudden it's almost on demand, two seconds to generate it. That's great. And that's because of the way the data is stored and uh, the S3, you asked about, oh, you know, is it slow? Well, not in that context, because what happens really with Vertica Eon mode is that it can, they have, um, when you set up your compute nodes, they have local storage also, which is called the depot. It's kind of a cache, okay? So the data will be drawn from the flash blade and cached locally. Uh, and that was, it was thought when they designed that, oh, you know, it's, that'll cut down on the latency. Okay, mm -hmm. but it turns out that if you have your compute nodes close, meaning minimal hops to uh, the flash blade, that you can actually uh, tell Vertica, you know, don't even bother caching that stuff. Just read it directly on the fly from the, from the flash blade and the performance is still really good. It depends on your situation. But I know, for example, a major telecom company that uh, uh, uses the same topologies we're talking about here, they did the same thing. They just, they just dropped the cache because the flash blade was able to, to deliver the, the data fast enough. So that's, you're talking about, that, that's speed of light issues and just the overhead of, 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 of switching infrastructure, is that, that gets eliminated? And so as a result, you can go directly to the storage array? That's correct, yeah. It's, it's like, it's fast enough that it's, it's almost as if it's, local to the compute node. Uh, but it, every situation is different depending on your, uh, your needs. If you've got like a few tables that are heavily used, uh, then yeah, put them, um, put them in the cache because that'll be probably a little bit faster. But if you have a lot of ad hoc queries that are going on, you know, the, you may exceed the storage of the local cache and then you're better off having it uh, just read directly from the, uh, from the flash blade. Got it. Look, at Pure is a fit. I mean, I sound like a fanboy, but Pure is all about simplicity. So is object. So that means you don't have to you know, worry about wrangling storage and worrying about LUNs and all that other you know, nonsense and, and file I, management. I've been burned by hardware in the past, yeah. you know, where, oh, okay, they're building to a price and so they cheap out on stuff like fans or, or <laughs> other things and these, these components fail and the whole thing goes down. But this hardware is super, super good quality. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy with the quality that, that we're getting. So CB, last question, what's next for you? Where do you want to take this, uh, this, this initiative? Well, we are in the process now of, we, we, um, when, so I, I designed the system to combine the best of the Kimball approach to data warehousing and the Inman approach, okay? And what we do is we bring over all the data we've got and we put it into a pristine staging layer, okay? Like I said, it's a, because it's append only, it's essentially a log of all the transactions that are happening in this company. Just they appear, okay? And then from the, the Kimball side of things, we're designing the data marts now so that uh, that's what the end users actually interact with. And so we're, we're taking um, the, we're examining the transactional systems to say, how are these business objects created? What's, what's the logic there? And we're recreating those logical models in, uh, in Vertica. So we've done a handful of them so far and it's working out really well. So going forward, 
we've got a lot of work to do to uh, create just about every object that, uh, that uh, the company needs. CB, you're an awesome guest. It's really always a pleasure talking to you. And uh, Thank you. congratulations and, and good luck going forward. Stay safe. Thank you, you too, Dave. Okay, let's summarize the convergence of file and object. First, I want to thank our guests, Matt Burr, Scott Sinclair, Garrett Belsner, and CB Bond. I'm your host, Dave Vellante, and please allow me to briefly share some of the key takeaways from today's program. So first, as Scott Sinclair of ESG stated, surprise, surprise, data's growing. And Matt Burr, he helped us understand the growth of unstructured data. I mean, estimates indicate that the vast majority of data will be considered unstructured by mid-decade, 80% or so. And obviously, unstructured data is growing very, very rapidly. Now, of course, your definition of unstructured data, and that may vary across, across a wide spectrum. I mean, there's video, there's audio, there's documents, there's spreadsheets, there's chat. I mean, these are generally considered unstructured data, but of course, they all have some type of structure to them. You know, perhaps it's not as strict as a relational database, but there's certainly metadata and certain structure to these types of use cases that I just mentioned. Now, the key to what Pure is promoting is this idea of unified fast file and object, UFFO. Look, object is great, it's inexpensive, it's simple, but historically it's been less performant. So good for archiving or cheap and deep types of examples. Organizations often use file for higher performance workloads, and let's face it, most of the world's data lives in file formats. What Pure is doing is bringing together file and object by, for example, supporting multiple protocols, i.e. NFS, SMB, and S3. S3, of course, has really given new life to object over the past decade. Now, the key here is to essentially enable customers to have the best of both worlds. Not having to trade off performance for object simplicity. And a key discussion point that we've had on the program has been the impact of Flash on the long, slow death of spinning disk. Look, hard disk drives, they had a great run. But HDD volumes, they peaked in 2010. And Flash, as you well know, has seen tremendous volume growth thanks to the consumption of Flash in mobile devices and then, of course, its application into the enterprise. And that volume is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. The price declines of Flash are coming down faster than those of HDD. So it's, the writing's on the wall. It's just a matter of time. So Flash is riding down that cost curve very, very aggressively. And HDD has essentially become you know, a managed decline business. Now, by bringing Flash to object as part of the Flash Blade portfolio and allowing for multiple protocols, Pure hopes to eliminate the dissonance between file and object and simplify the choice. In other words, let the workload decide if you have data in a file format, no problem. Pure can still bring the benefits of simplicity of object at scale to the table. So again, let the workload inform what the right strategy is, not the technical infrastructure. Now, Pure, of course, is not alone. There are others supporting this multi-protocol strategy. And so we asked Matt Burr, why Pure? What's so special about you? And not surprisingly, in addition to the product innovation, he went right to Pure's business model advantages. I mean, for example, with its evergreen support model, which was very disruptive in the marketplace. You know, frankly, Pure's entire business disrupted the traditional disk array model, which was fundamentally, it was flawed. Pure forced the industry to respond, and when it achieved escape velocity, velocity and Pure went public, the entire industry had to react. And a big part of the pure value prop, in addition to this business model innovation that we just discussed, is simplicity. Pure's keep it simple approach coincided perfectly with the ascendancy of cloud, where technology organizations needed cloud-like simplicity for certain workloads that were never going to move into the cloud. They were going to stay on-prem. Now, I'm going to come back to this, but allow me to bring in another concept that Garrett and CB really highlighted, and that is the complexity of the data pipeline. And what do, I mean, what do I mean by that? And why is this important? So Scott Sinclair articulated, he implied that the big challenge is organizations, they're data full, but insights are scarce. A lot of data, 
not as much insights, and it takes time, too much time to get to those insights. So we heard from our guests that the complexity of the data pipeline was a barrier to getting to faster insights. Now, C.B. Bond shared how he streamlined his data architecture using Vertica's Eon mode, which allowed him to scale compute independently of storage. So that brought critical flexibility and improved economics at scale. And Flashblade, of course, was the back end storage for his data warehouse efforts. Now, the reason I think this is so important is that organizations are struggling to get insights from data. And the complexity associated with the data pipeline and data life cycles, let's face it, it's overwhelming organizations. And there the answer to this problem is a much longer and different discussion than unifying object and file. That's, you know, I can spend all day talking about that. But let's focus narrowly on the part of the issue that is related to file and object. So the situation here is the technology has not been serving the business the way it should. Rather, the formula is twisted in the world of data and big data and data architectures. The data team is mired in complex technical issues that impact the time to insights. Now, part of the answer is to abstract the underlying infrastructure complexity and create a layer with which the business can interact that accelerates instead of impedes innovation. And unifying file and object is a simple example of this, where the business team is not blocked by infrastructure nuance, like does this data reside in a file or object format? Can I get to it quickly and inexpensively in a logical way? Or is the infrastructure in a stovepipe and, and, and blocking me? So if you think about the prevailing sentiment of how the cloud is evolving to incorporate on-premises workloads that are hybrid, and configurations that are working across clouds and now out to the edge, this idea of an abstraction layer that essentially hides the underlying infrastructure is a trend we're gonna see evolve this decade. Now, is UFFO the be all end all answer to solving all of our data pipeline challenges? No, no, of course not. But by bringing the simplicity and economics of object together with the ubiquity and performance of file, UFFO makes it a lot easier. It simplifies life for organizations that are evolving into digital businesses, which by the way, is every business. So we see this as an evolutionary trend that further simplifies the underlying technology infrastructure and does a better job supporting the data flows for organizations. So they don't have to spend so much time worrying about the technology details that add little value to the business. Okay, so thanks for watching The Convergence a file and object, and thanks to Pure Storage for making this program possible. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. We'll see you next time.